Hello everybody and welcome back to Marriage and Kinship. Today we are going to be talking about adoption. Throughout this course, we have wound up talking about adoption over and over again because it always comes up as one of the family arrangements that demonstrate the socially constructed nature of all kinship. And we've encountered some descriptions of fosterage in other societies, most notably the Malays of Langkawi. A lot of your papers also had some really great descriptions of Kazakhstani fosterage practices. But we haven't really talked about adoption itself. And so today we are going to fix that. I know we also talked about adoption when we talked about Borneman, but that case was pretty atypical, so set that aside. As we often do, let's start with some questions. And the first one is, what is an orphan and how do you become one? In English, this word implies that you don't have any family at all, perhaps most specifically that you don't have parents and you become an orphan when your parents die and it's very tragic. But, you know, which children really have no family? Even Harry Potter had his terrible aunt and uncle. So instead, it might be more useful to ask, how do children become exiled from one family or one kinship structure in order to become adoptable by a completely different family? We can also ask what happens when adult adoptees want to reconnect with the countries of their birth and their blood relatives. And what is their status like at home or what is home? Which home? Where is home? Because for adoptees, the answer to this question is not obvious. These days, the image of Korea is an image of wealth, of desirable pop culture, of beauty, but this is pretty recent. There is a relatively recent third world legacy in South Korea with an image that it was too poor to take care of its own children. Transnational adoption programs began in the 1950s to find homes for unwanted mixed race children who were often the products of local women and Western soldiers. So thanks, Korean War or no thanks. After the 1960s, it began to be a surrogate welfare system that encouraged the abandonment of children as a result of poverty. From the 1970s onward, the Korean government was starting to think this was kind of a bad look. They were trying to encourage domestic adoptions and limit the number of foreign adoptions, but that didn't last very long because from the 1980s, adoption programs were expanded again as part of civil diplomacy. And they were seen or began to be seen as a bridge to the West, right? So adult adoptees who then go to Korea and learn more about their history are now discovering that it's not that they didn't have a family, but rather that their families didn't have the resources to take care of them or the resources to bear up under social stigma. And lest you think that this is a problem that has been solved, 2,000 children are still sent overseas each year. All right, so when Korean children are sent overseas, who adopts them? Overwhelmingly, white families in the United States and Western Europe. Other than the fact that these families are white, they're demographically pretty varied with different class backgrounds, different religious backgrounds, and so on. As children, they experience a tremendous pressure to fit in with their white peers while also not being white. As adults, this is sort of flipped on its head. Their ability or their supposed ability to fit in to multiple places in Korea and in the West is precisely what makes them great. They have transitioned from being perhaps undesirable, poor children, mixed race children, to being desirable Korean co-ethnics. But 
they don't always fit in in either place. So what happens when adult adoptees return to Korea? Which 3,000 to 5,000 come to Korea each year and about 2,000 of those stay more long term. All right, now let's talk about neoliberalism, which is important because neoliberal ideas are what make it possible to reconceptualize adoptees in this way. So first of all, we have to start a little bit farther back in intellectual history and talk about classical liberalism. This is the idea that generally people should be free to do whatever they want so long as they don't hurt other people or interfere with other people's freedom. Free market capitalism has always been a core tenet of liberalism. So when people use the word liberal in conversation, they very often mean like permissive or relaxed. But when we talk about liberalism, we are talking about this specific political economic phenomenon that is also actually not very liberal or relaxed insofar as it tends to be associated with right-wing politics these days. Neoliberalism is, first of all, a resurgence of classical liberal ideals after a 20th century that saw a lot of more socialist governance even in the U.S. But also, in this resurgence, it's become sort of like extra, extra liberalism that emphasizes individual responsibility in all things. Social scientists tend not to like neoliberalism for precisely this reason. It takes an almost completely asocial perspective. Instead of thinking about society as composed of families, kin groups, institutions, all of which don't necessarily act as individuals, neoliberalism only sees individuals. Neoliberal conceptions of labor are also different to classical liberal ideals. So workers are not conceived of as laborers so much as they are conceived of as just a lower tier of capitalists, a lower tier of up-and-coming entrepreneurs. As a result, everyone is supposed to have this entrepreneurial spirit and to get and retain jobs, workers are expected to be constantly learning new skills, upping their game, hustling, 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 because workers are not a class of people with common interests as opposed to bosses, but rather they are entrepreneurs who are competing bidders for the same job. If you are preparing your CV and looking for a job right now, I hope this hits home. I hope this sounds familiar. But this is the context that makes adoptees seem so amazing from the contemporary Korean perspective. They have skills, multicultural competence, English fluency, and a Western education. So that's what adoptees, in theory, get out of adoption. But what is lost in this process? One adoptee that Kim quote says, if you continue to send children overseas, don't think that it's like a study abroad program. It's not at all like that. It's adoption, which is to say that it's irreversible. There is an irreversible separation from original family, birth family, culture, and language involved. Moreover, while the fantasy is that adoptees get these perfect rich lives in the West, not every adoptee grows up wealthy or has access to the kinds of educations that Koreans might envy, especially if you're thinking about the U.S. Think about ridiculous American university tuition. So for many adoptees, it is very troubling to have people talk about them as if they're lucky because they have suffered these losses of their original family and culture and language, but they also haven't got the expected opportunities. And so Kim tells us, in refusing to choose between 
an adopted country and a native country, adoptee resident returnee seem to hover between past and present in ways that can be curious and troubling. The idea is that it's normal for adoptees to want to come to Korea at least for a time to explore their roots, but staying, that's that's weird. That seems like giving up all these things that they were supposed to get out of adoption in exchange for what? But this perspective on adoption doesn't really understand what has been lost. It's certainly true that resident returnee adoptees live pretty liminal lives in Korea. And while they might have been othered on account of their race in North America or Europe, they're still other within Korea. About 47% work as English teachers, and that is unskilled, low-paid labor. Those jobs are not great. And some might go on to get a master's degree, perhaps, or a certification in teaching English as a foreign language. They can gain skills and professionalize themselves to get better jobs, but a lot don't. It's also much harder to do if you're not white. Asian American friends of mine who have spent time in East Asia have often expressed this sense that they're maybe like disappointing people, that, you know, they're not what people expect of Americans or Canadians or Europeans because they're not white. They they don't fit this image of an English speaker. And they're often assumed to be locals just in terms of when people look at them and they see, you know, an Asian face. But then as soon as they open their mouths, it's obvious that they're not local. These jobs also don't have a lot of opportunity for advancement. Even if you get a good job teaching at universities, there's still not like a lot of promotion that's necessarily available. Most are unmarried because how can you settle down when you are constantly deferring to a return to a place that you don't come from to stay in another place that you kind of also don't come from and you're sort of living between places. And so as a result, adoptees tend to form their own communities, which are distinct from other Koreans and other foreigners. We have this wonderful quote from another adoptee that Kim interviews who says, I don't feel totally assimilated in Korea. I don't feel totally assimilated in America. It would be easier to just pick one culture, but I I don't want to. That, that just doesn't make sense to her. She is American and she is Korean and it's complicated. So with all of this in mind, I want to leave you with some questions about what does kinship do? So earlier in the semester, we started asking, how do we do kinship? How do we make kinship? And now I kind of want to flip that question around. And we sort of started asking this question with Wolf Meyer. What does kinship do? What is accomplished socially by claiming people as kin or by severing family connections? What is hidden and what is created? For example, we might say that in the past, in the 1950s, in the 1960s, families used the process of adoption to hide shameful childbearing. (laughs) Whereas by the 1980s, um, with the resurgence of neoliberalism, um, you have instead the idea that claiming Korean adoptees as kin is creating a bridge between the West and between South Korea. We can ask what do adoptees gain in returning to Korea and what do Koreans gain by recognizing adoptees as blood kin in spite of the severed legal relationships between adoptees and their families and 
do the plans of both adoptees and Koreans, do they work? Do they work out? Finally, I want to leave you with this quote where Kim says, these common experiences with racialized exclusion and isolation suggest some of the genuine limits to vernacular assumptions about adoptees' human capital and both neoliberal and progressive modes of cosmopolitanism as the individual pursuit of unfettered consumption and capital accumulation or as democratic solidarity in a world community. Can adoptees be cosmopolitan? What does it mean to be cosmopolitan? And what does neoliberalism convince us is possible about the free movement of people that might not actually be possible? So I will leave you there and I will talk to you next time.